the button. All right, it says we're live. I guess that means we're live. We are live. We are consistently cool. bad at knowing when we are live. It's <laughs> the other <laughs> really cool benefit of doing a podcast situation with us. Um, yep. Hi, everyone. It's Suicide and Stuff. Um, we should start out with our rating because I can tell that all of us are very close to cussing. Um, we are rated R for language terror and some disturbing images. Des usually it facilitates the disturbing images. A lot of times it has to do with meat or beef. Y'all heard of veterinarian on like nobody has further <laughs> pictures on their phone than a veterinarian. So like Ooh, on, like, yeah. Um, so, okay. So you might not be the one putting the grossest pictures up today. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> love this already. Um, yep, I am excited, excited as <laughs> usual for our guests today because I'm every time I get to talk about like, suicide, I'm excited. Um, my name is Jess, and I love to talk about suicide. Um, I am a mad queer feminist and uh, witch and healer. And I work in Denver, um, so-called Denver, which is land stolen from Arapaho, Cheyenne, Ute, and Sioux people at um, our crisis line for our state and our peer support line for our state. Um, and I can tend to focus my work on intersectional justice-based emotional support for marginalized folks. Um, I believe in mutual aid and disability justice and other liberation ideologies as ways to <laughs> Solve the problems that lead to suicide. That's my introduction. I wrote it down. Des never writes hers, but I'm making her go next anyway. <laughs> I'm Des. I do stuff. <laughs> like, I'll let you. too much fucking stuff for the life that I lead. Um, but the most important thing is live through this, um, which is a series of portraits and true stories of suicide attempt survivors across the U.S. I don't have any veterinarians yet, though. Mm. Well, we can um, um, very good. No, I'm never leaving my house again. Um, but yeah, uh, and I do tech for this beautiful podcast um, and other things. What else? I believe in most of the things Jess does, but I'm not a fucking hippie, so I'm not a witch. And except that you you have a gift that you've given your wife that you keep in a plastic bag in your home because that's how you're keeping the ghosts from getting out so no not me she's keeping the ghosts from right getting but out. that's I in have your nothing home. to do with this yeah you have a witch okay, house i gave her a hair locket okay yeah i know i'm I excited like about it. Shit. um <laughs> what else i don't know i like cuban coffee i'm trying to be more organized in my life and that's that's all i've got right now i don't know that's enough that's a lot of stuff yeah yeah tell that's us long. about yourself carrie yeah. uh, my name's carrie uh <laughs> i also do stuff too much of it um i currently have four jobs which is too many jobs um but uh so i'm a veterinarian i'm a weird kind of veterinarian i'm a, what's called a veterinary specialist so i am a neurologist and neurosurgeon so i'm a dog brain surgeon which is not not very common there's only like 300 of this in north america so but i love my job i super do um and then my other really important job is i am the president of an organization called not one more vet which is the largest, I love that we get to say that now, the largest um, yeah. charity for veterinary professionals. And we focus on suicide prevention and wellness for our community because turns out we have a lot of problems, a lot, <laughs> a lot of problems. Uh, we have the dubious honor of uh, maybe having the highest suicide rate in the in the world for as a profession like I swear, like when I when we started this organization, I was gonna get a t-shirt made that said, "Yes, worse than dentist." Um, <laughs> so, you do that. Doesn't it make t-shirts for everything? I mean, because like everything. Well, and the other thing is like when you say like, "Oh, we do suicide prevention for vets." People think veterans, like obviously, right, yeah. and not to like everybody's got problems. And it, I always like to say like vets are super competitive, which is kind of at some of the like heart of what's what's up with us. And I'm like, guys, we don't want to win this one. Like, right. we'll let somebody else have it. Like, let's let's focus on other things to compete at. So, um, but yeah. So, uh, we started very innocently as a Facebook group. Um, we lost a very prominent member of our profession to suicide, and a couple of vets were talking. And Nicole MacArthur is our founder, and she said that text conversation was the first time she never she 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 didn't feel like she was a stupid, terrible vet. She didn't feel like she was the worst vet in the world. That's my dog, Max. Yeah. His collar will be 20 barks because he barks too much. It just, <laughs> um, 
Whoa. Ugh, sir, you don't have to guard oh me. Um, we're, he's he's brand new. He's, he's a big guy. Yeah. Um, God, I lost my train of thought. Okay, so Nicole, though, like, she had this conversation, and she was like, oh, I'm not the worst vet in the world. I'm not stupid. I'm not terrible at my job. I'm just a vet. And, like, she just wanted it to keep going, so she started a group to hang out with some of her vet school classmates, and they invited their friends. I got invited on the second day, and now we have over 30,000 members. Uh, awesome. Yeah, and, like, it's grown into... A, a, something that takes 30 or 40 hours my week. So, there you well, go. Max has an excellent treat right now, Carly. He got one of the like high value ones. He got a bully stick, which I don't generally give out. Uh -oh. But um, Max, mommy needs to do this. So can you just quiet for mommy, please? Here. Penis. Enjoy your penis. Yeah, exactly. I was like, buddy, like, just give you a little bit of dick. Will you be quiet? Okay. <laughs> We're terrible. Carly yeah. always believes that dogs deserve more treats. Um, and she compliments them when they're being bad all the time. Um, which is why all of the pets that I've ever had treat Carly like their staff. Um, so like my last dog, when she would come over, he would go to the door. He was like, oh, aren't you here to take me outside? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Little jerks. I have I have chihuahuas are my, my oh. pet of choice. So. Oh, chihuahuas. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, there's my sister. She thinks you fit in. Hi. Hello, Jenny. Yeah. We were like, oh, here's the stuff. I was like, these are my people. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, that's. I'm really excited too. You know, you never know when we book people. I never know. And also, I kept forgetting because we booked like a ways in advance, and mm -hmm. then I would be like vet, and then I was like, is this veterans or veterinarians? <laughs> I'm sure that that happens a lot. Um, so, um, so, uh, I know you, you had a conversation with some people and that's kind of how you got started in the work, but is there anything else you would want to tell us about what makes you interested in uh, suicide and suicide prevention? Um, I'd say, I'd say like, you know, I was pretty, um, stupid about my own mental health for a long time. Um, I think there's a lot of stigma in our profession from getting help. We're, we're a profession that's really into being tough. Like just work another 40 hours this week um, is kind of like, you know, like, are you feeling bad? Work harder is kind of how veterinarians work. And, and I was the same, even though I ended up like in an, an emergency psych appointment during vet school, like even though, and I was just like, so I'd read like articles on compassion fatigue and stuff and be like, that's not me. I'm not a wimp, you know, like, but terrible, terrible, right? Yeah. And actually, you know, when I was really starting to burn out, I, um, of course, was overachieving. And I had just been tapped to be the medical director of a, a hospital. Um, and I knew one of our employees, who was a good, dear friend of mine. Um, she was having a bad time. Like, she's in the middle of a really nasty divorce. Mm. And, like, life was not great. She was having career problems. Like, everything was bleeding together. And, like, she was in surgery um, on this young dog. And the dog was not doing well, it was starting to die. She's a boarded surgeon, she's very, maybe one of the best I've ever seen. And um, she called me in to scrub in with her because she needed another pair of hands. Um, and we were working so fast, right? Like we were trying to save this dog's life. Every neuron on my brain was doing that, right? Like we were, we were in the dog's chest, I had the dog's heart in my hands, like we were, it was intense, right? This other doctor was like running the anesthesia, it was very, very intense. And I, her hands just stopped. And she looked up at me and she said, Carrie, if this dog dies, I'm quitting my job. I'm going home and I'm going to kill myself. Okay, let's keep going. And I was just like, fuck, fuck. You know, like right. I, I didn't know what to do. I now have like all sorts of training on what to do. But like in that moment, no clue, zero clue. Oh God, I'm sorry. And like, yeah. And so, I mean, I went upstairs. Uh, I pulled her employee file and we, I called her sister who I had never met. Uh, but I knew that she loved her sister very much. And I was like, hi, Gail, I'm Carrie. And she's like, hi, Carrie. I've heard all about you. I was like, well, this is a shitty way to meet. But, um, you know, we got to help her. And so, and thankfully we did. You know, her therapist is great. She took a lot of like, you know, responsibility in her own care too. So it was, it was a wake up call for me because, you know, that was my friend, my really smart friend who works super hard. Like, mm -hmm. yikes like yikes like and it made me really take a hard look at myself too and be like hey remember when you 
screwed up a presentation in vet school and didn't feel safe and took yourself to mental health care, like this is not just your friend, right? Like mm -hmm. a lot of us. So, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I currently still kind of actively do that a little bit in my life. I'm like, well, no, I'm fine. Everything's great here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, yeah. Um, I'm better than I used to be, I would say. Yeah. Um, I mean, what does that mean, though? <laughs> like, we I mean, still suck. Here's what, I, here's what oh, I, yeah. I love talking about suicidal ambivalence because, like, yeah. I think everybody, like, goes to this, like, oh my God, someone says they're suicidal, like, 911 emergency, like, Mm -hmm. <laughs> but like, I talk to veterinarians all the time and like, I see these statistics, one in four veterinarians feel suicidal, one in six veterinarians feel suicidal. And she's like, what does that mean? Like, that's terrifying. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, have you ever thought about it? She's like, yeah, but I mean, like passing not serious was like, yeah, that counts. Like also counts. Like it doesn't like, you don't have to have like a dramatic rescue situation or a hospitalization. Like, yeah. and the more we talk about that, like ambivalence, and I've started to yeah. recognize that when I like, when I hear those thoughts, it's like, okay, we're not coping with something right now. We need to work on that. <laughs> like, yeah. We're going to talk about that a little bit. So um, it's been, you know, it's it's important for me to just say it all out, you know, like yeah. it, it's a lot of us and that's okay. Like, yeah. I mean, we talk to each other. I, I'm kind of like suicidal between low key and high key on any given day, but always suicidal pretty much. And, and we yeah. talk about it very like casually, obviously, but um, and with a lot of sarcasm usually, but yeah. it's like, um, yeah, I think there's this idea that uh, like suicide is always an emergency and it's not, yeah. um, like more than anything, I think when people are suicidal, it's this great indication that they're ready for something to change, which mm -hmm. is like, you know, a little better than just being entirely stuck, but not being ready for change. So like as someone who works in the crisis world, I would I feel much more equipped to work with a suicidal person than with someone who is just stuck and doesn't know what they want to see on the other side of stuff. Cause usually when you're suicidal, you can point to exactly what you want to be different. Or exa yeah, exactly. Like these, these five things. things are not okay. And this one thing today was especially bad. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, like right. I, yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I've talked to a lot of, of veterinarians and veterinary professionals who are suicidal at this point. And like, yeah, they're usually quite clear about the list of problems. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder like how people aren't suicidal. I'm like, what, mm -hmm. what are you, how are you like doing it? Like, how are you functioning <laughs> right now? Like, what is <laughs> just like, does it, don't you ever just not want to solve your problems and like, feel bad? <laughs> like, I don't get it. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad, I'm happy for them. I'm happy for them. Yeah. Cool. I mean, cool. Like, I just, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. it, to the degree that sometimes I'm like, I don't believe you. <laughs> I don't believe that you're not suicidal. I don't say well, that. I, I mean, I do think that there, there's so much stigma around discussing it. Like people are concerned about consequences, especially in my profession. Oh, yeah. There are consequences to mm -hmm. it. And so like, you know, it makes it hard to talk about. And then, you know, yeah. people are like, oh, but I didn't mean it. I didn't think I was not, wasn't serious. You're like, okay. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at it as, as like, my coping mechanisms are overwhelmed. Like if that, if that mm -hmm. thought starts popping in the head, it's like, oh, okay, like let's, let's ramp down ADH squirrel. Like what's happening with you right now? Like, <laughs> did you take your meds this morning? Did you, did you forget? You did, you did. Didn't you? <laughs> like, yeah. I think because um, people I know, I have a few people I know in my life that are, um, have been recently diagnosed with ADHD. Instagram started, um, advertising this robot that feeds you your pills not what? Them, but it shoots them out it started advertising it to me and what? i'm like i don't have that many pills but uh, i feel like i know people who might want this i, I, like, uh, I have yeah. timer caps on on amazon where it's mm. like because i'll take my pill and forget three minutes later mm. um you know because squirrel is squirrel like there was a shiny thing over there and i don't remember if i did it or not and so like mm. this i can look down and be like you know you open that 45 seconds ago put the <laughs> uh, or like oh god it's been two days like either or mm. uh, but yeah it's helpful so. i would love a robot to give me my uppers my oh well if you would like me to send you the instagram ad about this robot <laughs> it doesn't actively feed them to you that's a different kind of robot and technically it's not a robot it's a machine i spent a lot of time talking about the difference with my my uh housemate and my husband recently Google, yeah. Why are you like 
a robot in my opinion you know you yeah. just put face on yeah it. there you go yeah um, i like this the problem you know, i love that people are starting to talk about mental health um, yeah. on social media uh, there's a great tiktoker i follow katie soros who talks about being an adult woman with adhd and i'm like i have learned so much i was like like no it's great yeah so yeah i have a num a number of like adult women in my life who have been recently diagnosed because of course women never got diagnosed when they were younger <laughs> you know that they, they made the diagnostic cr criteria based on boys and there wasn't right, yeah. so mm -hmm. like like it's still like there's still a, like they're like well you did well in school so you can't have it i'm like yeah no i'm real fucking mad about it yeah <laughs> about getting diagnosed at 37 yeah i, I yeah. was 40, i was 40 and, and it took me three years of seriously trying like see because like and like of course like literally all my friends were like of course you have that what do you mean you're not diagnosed i just figured you didn't like to take meds it was like oh no no they won't diagnose me um yeah anyway so uh, uh, we have a, a few of our adhd folks on <laughs> on right now oh. so <laughs> Usually, like um, they're probably multitasking, but uh, yeah. um, don't you outgrow ADHD? <laughs> <laughs> Not in my experience. <laughs> um, so okay, so into let's, it even more. Get back, let's get back to suicide and stuff, right? Right. Um, so, you okay, so stuff. you mentioned that vets don't access that there's risks to accessing treatment. Yeah. So let's talk more about that. Like, yeah. what can happen? So we have a really sad study um, that shows that 50% of vets in serious psychologic distress. So like, not just like a little bit, like very serious, like the type of, the level of distress that requires mental health care to get through, 50% of them won't access care. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of that is about stigma. A lot of people think that people will not be sympathetic, um, that it will be, you know, it will reflect badly on them. Um, a lot, there are three or four states that still ask questions about receiving mental health treatments on your licensing. So people are very concerned that it will affect their ability to do their career. Um, and you go into terrible debt to become a veterinarian. And so if you can't do your career, like that is significantly, uh, you know, it, it's usually also people's calling, right? Like most people who become yeah. veterinarians, like you didn't just do it on a whim, right? Like, it's like, from the time I could walk, I wanted to be a veterinarian, right? Like it's that level of that. And like people are terrified their careers can be taken away. Um, and yeah. so they don't get help. And then the other reality is like, we all work entirely too much. You know, there's always another sick dog. There's always another phone call to make. There's always, and like the thought that I would get out of the clinic at 1 PM on a Thursday to go speak to a therapist is hilarious. Um, yeah. So like that, that's also a reality. And then, you know, there's a significant amount of veterinary practices. They're small businesses with small amount of employees and they, they don't all have health benefits. Veterinary medicine is not, despite what people say, like it's, it's actually not a very lucrative industry. Like we don't actually make a lot of money. Medicine costs a lot of money. And so, and like our clients have to pay cash. And so like we end up usually starving ourselves and our employees, not paying them enough, not giving them enough benefits just so we can do the thing that we love to do, which is help animals. And so it creates this whole vicious cycle, vicious, vicious cycle, um, yeah. which, yeah. you know, we've, we certainly talk very openly, clearly um, about mental health problems to try to destigmatize it. And, and it, it does seem to be working. They've repeated that study um, a, a two years apart. And like some of the stigma stuff was better, which is good to see. It's great to see. Um, and then we've also been working with companies like BetterHelp, um, we have, you know, like a deal with better help to get anyone in the veterinary profession, a month of therapy for free with an online mm -hmm. therapist, you know, cause you can do asynchronous, you know, like you get home mm -hmm. at midnight from a call, like, and it was hard and you need to say something about it. You can type out a message to their therapist and they'll message you back the next day. Like that's so important. Like yeah. that access is huge and it's a lot cheaper too. So like people who are in financial distress, like can like get some, get some help, you know, which is great. So, yeah, well, I know what that cricket sound is. Jess, you're in trouble. What did this I do? You. Oh, it's cricket just sound is your damn computer. There's not <laughs> much I can do about that. My computer okay. gets loud. I don't know why it makes no sense and it makes sounds. Yeah, sorry about sorry. it. I, I, will, I will meet when I'm not talking to get rid of the cricket sound. 
Uh, it's yeah. actually illegal. It's a violation of the ADA, Jennifer, to Jennifer's point. Like, um, state yeah. licensing should not be able to ask those questions. It's just a matter of like, has anyone gone and legally challenged it yet? And so, mm. um, you know, once I get through the, the other 400 items on my to-do list, <laughs> we can oh, start that. doing that. So I think there's like a, that's a cool thing to like collaborate on across professions though that do that is that like if we could build or maybe work with like the uh some of the disability law centers on building a pathway to, to challenging that that we could all use over and over again yeah. that would be really cool Great. i'm real interested in that and we'll probably take on a project i don't have time for now <laughs> but but i think that's so important for yeah. like because that happens in the um, oh, the cricket sound is soothing. That's good. Um, that happens in the mental health field as well. Um, although they, they might not ask on like the licensing board, but they're going to ask in other places or like your organization will ask in ways that are not appropriate or or like tell, sort of tell you that you can't do this work if you have lived experience. I think that comes up all the time. Um, or if you're if, if you have a mental health um challenge or experiences that are unusual then um you're not able to to do this work so mm. um i think that cuts across a lot of professions yeah for sure, for sure. i mean it's hard yeah. i mean I, I i like the idea of professional standards and like you know everybody being great at their jobs and all of that but i think part of that is like if you've got a problem go get help for it and so anything that's getting in the way of that is just so wrong like so wrong like would you rather have, a, you know, a professional who's depressed and not getting help or a professional who's depressed and getting help? Like, I mean, and like if somebody has gotten through treatment and is doing well, like, shouldn't they be supported and congratulated for that and not punished for it? So it just it makes me so mad. So mad. Right. Um, and one of the big issues with vets, too, is the access to lethal means. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the other really scary statistics around vets is um, about completions. Um, and I hate calling it completions. I know that's not actually quite technically yeah, what we don't do anymore. Yeah. Um, but we, there, unfortunately, we have access and training. Um, there's not a veterinarian on the planet who doesn't know the dose of euthanasia solution for a mammal. Like, right. just doesn't, like, it's, it's something that's in all of our brains. You have that drug in your hand, you know, hopefully not every day, but certainly often. Um, and also veterinarians are, trained and discussed daily that death is a reasonable end to suffering. You know, it, it mm -hmm. permeates kind of your, your, your entire being that this is an okay way to end suffering. And it's, it you, you can see it reflected. in you, if you ask vets about human euthanasia, like medical euthanasia, we as a profession, very strongly, it's like 98% of us agree with human medical mm -hmm. euthanasia. Um, and that, you know, like that includes very religious people who would not otherwise probably, but like that professional belief, permeates across and then you have access. And so there was a study, um, Dr. Tracy Witte, a suicidologist out of Auburn. Mm -hmm. Great. I love her. Um, she, um, she did a study looking at our um, standard mortality ratios, right? Like how much more likely are we to die than the general public by suicide? And she found, found in veterinarians, like not only was the use of things like euthanasia solution, the number one means like the top way that it happens, but also like if that wasn't there, our suicide ratios would actually be pretty close to the general public. And so it was like, I mean, not that means prevention is 100%, but it is certainly an effective thing. And so like we've started to push a lot for means prevention as well. Like just saying like, yeah. um, there's this great program called Four Eyes Saves Lives where, you know, these are controlled substances, they're under lock and key, but you know, one person can often go access them without somebody else. And so, you know, we encourage two key systems or like systems where somebody else has to sign off just so like, it's just a little bit of check and balance. And like those, those programs have unfortunately hit a lot of like clapback, mm -hmm. which makes me sad. Um, yeah. People are, people are resistant to, well, I think you guys probably know, like people are generally, you always hear something when you talk about means prevention, because people yeah. are like, that doesn't solve the problem. Well, no, it doesn't, but it gives us some time to maybe talk about the problem and solve it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I yeah think distraction is the biggest piece, right? Hmm? Yeah. Distraction is the biggest, the biggest piece of uh, crisis intervention. Yeah. yeah. I think what gets complicated is when we try and force means intervention, like means restriction as an intervention. And that's where I get concerned. Yeah. Like I think coercion is bad. Um, mm -hmm. and so, and I agree. And I will say yeah. 
that's a big, I will say that that's been an evolution in, you know, and for me in the last five years, you know, taking my initial training classes to be a crisis counselor and all of that, like active rescue, consensual or not consensual was always discussed. And like, I will admit that we have done that, you know, when, when our group and like, it didn't feel awesome. I'm going to tell you that right now, like didn't feel awesome. Um, and it's something that we're, we're moving away from. We're, we're really talking about how important it is um, to give agency and walk with people and, and let them, you know, know that you're there with them to, to make the solutions that make sense for them. Because like, you know, there's, there's scary statistics out there about active rescue. Oh, you yeah. Know, I mean, we talk about all of the like, you know, we've talked about all of, I mean, ha who hasn't been talking about police and police violence and things recently? You look at 23% of fatal calls for, with the police yep. were like mental health crises, maybe. And I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> like, like, that's, that's not the end we're looking for. Um, right. We're, we're looking to get somebody to help. And then, you know, if they get taken to an ER that doesn't have adequate psychiatric care or if they're hospitalized against their will, like, it's just not clear from the literature I've read and, you know, talking to Tracy that that does good. You know, we want to make sure like, I took an oath to do no harm. Right. Like that's an important premise. Dude. Yeah. Um, we talk about um, yeah. I'm obsessed with you. <laughs> <laughs> So you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think like um, as a field in suicide prevention, there's a lot of reckoning that we have to do around our use of force um, because we've had evidence for a very very long time that hospitalization is not helpful, that police interaction is not helpful, and we continue to defend those interventions because we can't come up with something better. Like. That's some just fuckery. Like, I, I, be a little creative. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I love you know. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, and so like we are pretty progressive here, right? Like, it's kind of what we're known for. Um, and uh, I, we actually just added a new board member who is a mental health professional. He's a, um, I'm gonna get this wrong. I think he's a psychiatrist, maybe an. MFT. Um, anyway, he runs uh, the Marin, some of the Marin crisis center, crisis lines. And like he, he was talking about, he's like, we are lucky that we don't send the cops anymore. We send a mobile crisis unit, like people who can deescalate and talk and are trained. And like, you know, it isn't about force and it isn't about taking them somewhere they don't want to go. And it isn't. And I'm like, yeah, like if I could just be sure that that was everywhere, like that sounds okay. But like, you know, I don't want to burst the mobile crisis bubble, but they are people that use coercion. So I, so we send mobile crisis too. But yeah. like, I think sometimes as a field, we're like, oh, mobile crisis instead. And that's great as long as those people aren't just involuntarily hospitalizing everyone and having the police come pick them up anyway. And, yeah. and I don't think that I feel very, I don't feel so confident in our mental health professionals to, to do the things that they're supposed to do. But that's like and, because of my own lived experience with them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It depends yeah. on the person. And unless you've got that kind of training, man, people are just going to do what, you know, what they're told to do. They're going to call 911. Or they're going to, you know, they're going to do the ER. And I mean, as someone who's training to be a clinician right now, a th yeah. you know, a mental health clinician, like it's, it is fucking mind boggling. The absolute lack of critical thinking we are, we are asked to do around the people that we're serving. And I, and I think it's for me, like I have noticed in my own role that I fell into <laughs> um, talking to suicidal people, like it is a lot about the person who's talking to them, like own level of like activation, right? Like how emotional are you about this conversation right now? Like, mm -hmm. calm? and I noticed the guy that was treating, uh, was training me on the crisis line um, was he, he was like, he was never he's just like, look, he's like, you absolutely can. But he's like, the longer you do this, the less you will do it. And it, it just has to do with your skill level, your training level, you know, like your, um, your ability to use another solution. Like it's, it's right. the last resort solution. And it's not a great one. Yeah. You know, and it's hard because like, I'm a veterinarian, right? Like, I'm not a mental health professional. 
but I am very interested in this and I'm a nerd and read a lot of things, but you know, like it's just, it's a situation where like, and my opinion has changed, like, because I came from a place where I got the training that everybody gets and like yeah. trying to do the things I was supposed to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know. And I well, think these are radical ideas. Apparently, so good at it. So, I think so often um, our trainings skip the part where you have to deal with your own stuff, mm -hmm. and so people come into this work and they're afraid, or they've lost someone, or they have their own pain that they're not willing to go to again, and so they have this block, and there's a line, and that person is coming up with what their whatever their own line is. For like, here's where I call someone else. This has to be someone else's job because I can't do it anymore. And that's what people are doing. It's not be, It's not about the other person. It's about you. But if we're not doing training that addresses their own values and ethics and, and the limitations of what they feel like they're able to do, they're never going to be able to sit with someone in that level of pain without passing the buck. Um, I, I love working with veterinary professionals like uh, because... We have hard conversations every day. Like the people that work on my and my peer support places, like they tell someone that you know their their friend has cancer every day. Like you you are used to like having a hard, weird, emotional conversation. Yeah. Like people people, I literally make somebody cry every single day. I'm in the clinic, like every single day. Like somebody breaks down in tears in front of me, and like yeah. I'm like. I'm, I can sit with that. Like, I'm very good with that. And so when I explained to our peer volunteers, I was like, I want you to think about it like a client. Like, I want you to think about like, this is your peer, but like, I want you to like, take a breath and like, go into a headspace where you can be calm about this. Because honestly, like, you're going to make better decisions. You're going to lead them through a hard moment better. You're going to walk with them a lot better if you can be present and not freaked out. So totally. Right. Um, I know that we, we really, we pretend there's like a beef corner where we only talk about beefs, but this whole thing is, is beef corner. Um, but I'm wondering, all right, all right. If we want to shift into beef corner. Is it time? It's time. It, oh yeah. It's time. So oh, it's time. oh, Carol. <laughs> Carol. <laughs> it's so, we'll fake Carol so, I'm so grossed out by the meat. Oh, if that grosses you out, you should I, never scroll through my phone. Uh, oh my gosh. Oh, so I did a, I have to tell you, I did a mentorship with a vet when I was a kid because um, I thought I wanted to be a vet. And I, so I like went into a surgery room where they were just doing like, it was like a spay and a neuter and I passed out from watch. And that's like, they barely even open anything up. That was, it's, this is not my thing. It's cool. Yeah. Other people can do it. Um, you, for example. <laughs> um, but and it's funny because like with human body stuff, I'm fine. But animals, I just can't. You know, no, they're because they're better than us. Yeah. So I am a veterinarian. I was supposed to be a a people doctor, not a animal doctor. And uh, and I started working in human healthcare, and I discovered that I don't have enough sympathy for sick people. Like if you're sick, I'm kind of like a. <laughs> could you? Uh, like it's kind of gross. Like, mm, but like, there's a sick puppy, and I'm like, hey, okay. like, sorry. Back path. This is. I mean, we have a lot of like mugs and stuff in veterinary medicine. Is like veterinary medicine because people are gross. Um, so you know. Yep. Um. So who has some beefs for today? I mean, you got a beef desk. Talk. Everything, all of it. I don't, what, what, what do I even fucking say? Just everything, <laughs> every single thing, yeah. every single thing. Like someone, who the fuck was texting me earlier or saw it on Twitter about CNN's like use of the phrase breaking news? <laughs> like, I was thinking about it because 2021 has just been breaking news like every three seconds. You don't get to call it news anymore. It's just like, and, and here is what's now. Just brace yeah. yourself. Brace yourselves. I think maybe they should replace it with brace yourself. Currently, right. <laughs> like, here's a new thing that happened. Like, yeah. I don't know. Just 2021, all of it. It's what we're 12 days in. Yeah. <laughs> um, my beef. My beef is. Yeah. Um, so veterinarians are essential workers in the pandemic, um, and uh, 
we we were asked to be essential workers. We very we, we we all took an oath to uphold public health. We take it very seriously. Like people get real like you know tear like I took an oath like like in right like when they were like we need you to work in the pandemic without PPE. We need you to see the general public without PPE because the human hospital needs it. My friends were like packing the PPE. We we're like no, they need it. We're good. Like let's let's roll. So. Recently, um, it has come to light that many veterinarians will not be receiving um, COVID vaccines with other essential healthcare workers in many states. And it pisses me the fuck off. Um, so like Massachusetts, oh um, like not even with other like, you know what, in, in this pandemic, like human healthcare comes first. Absolutely. Like those ER doctors, like I would give them my kidney right now, much less my COVID vaccine. Um, but there are states where they were like, you can get it with the general public. And it's like, but we're essential. What? You asked. Wow. So California is, has really honestly like stepped up and like named us like essential healthcare workers. And like, I am super happy with California. Um, I will say the logistics are a nightmare right now, but Hey, we're all working together and we're all going to get it done. But like, that is just not the case. A lot of states, like they're like eh, veterinarians, who cares? And it's just like, Wow. That's very upsetting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my staff okay. doesn't have, my staff is like tier two and we're essential workers, but we don't have face to face contact because we're telephonic. Right. I mean, they're all, they're all having contact with each other. So there's risk there, but it's different. I don't get it. That's very annoying. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I found a really great angry panda gif to go along with, with that complaint on Twitter, just FYI, it's like a real mad panda. Yeah. So I, check that out. I mean, I did. I, I had my my therapy session with my therapist today. Shout out to my therapist Maya, who I love very much. And she's like, "How you doing?" I was like, "I don't think we should ask that question anymore." <laughs> like, I just, mm. I don't. What am I supposed to answer? Um, you know, like no, uh, no, I ate an entire box of Girl Scout cookies and, you know, drank while watching C-SPAN. What do you, how the hell do you think I'm doing? Like, not well. Like, so. That doesn't uh, sound terrible to me. I, like, I mean, coping is coping. <laughs> yeah. uh, where, where do I get the thin mints? Like, where the fuck are they? You can get them online most of the time. I, right? I had mine shipped in. Yeah. Some, yeah. some. It, it's not time yet, is it? No, some friend's child. I, I, not even like, I don't even know this child. They were like, please help little Susie reach yeah. her goal. I was like, you're going to whatever like special like award ceremony. You're going to, you won, you won girl. Like, <laughs> it's like different does. It's like different times of year in different States at different times. So you can go to the Girl Scout website and this, like, I legit got the like sneaky East coast cookies. So yeah, for, these were DC area cookies. So there you go guys. Holy fuck. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> the Very good. good. Have all your beefs right on day. So the beefs are not, they're not, they're good, not done. Definitely chocolate helps. Yeah. I don't even know what my beefs are. I'm I don't think anymore. Yeah. They're just like, I'm just surrounded by beef. It smells like meat all the yeah. time. It's just everything's like rotting cow beef everywhere. That went somewhere. It's gross. It. The world is gross and it smells bad. <laughs> I've actually smelled a rotting cow. It's pretty terrible. So. Yeah. Uh, people just, I, I just feel like I know people are, humanity is just like fucking terrible. Um, oh girl, but, the general public, you don't, people are, I give a lot of grace to people who come into the veterinary clinic, right? A mm. lot of grace. You see someone like me on a bad day, right? Like you are not excited. You are not excited to come see a veterinary neurologist. It means your dog is paralyzed. Maybe it's a brain tumor. Like we are, in it oh, now, God. right um so i get screamed at a lot i've had my life threatened like three times yeah, um yeah. you know good. Good, good. um but it has been like people are not kind right now like people yeah. are especially just keyed up you know and you can just tell i was like i bet you were a nice person last year yeah. um you'll find it again you'll find it again but like i also like you don't get to scream at my staff you yeah. know, you have to wear a mask, like when you're talking to them, like, I don't care. No, you will have to leave. I'm sorry that your dog is very sick, but no, like, you know, like, this is like, it's, 
it's mind blowing. And I just, I think I am such like a big bleeding heart empath that I'm just like, I feel everyone. I'm just like, I want to, yeah. like, I, I see how stressed out you are, but also if you yell at my ride or die staff one more time as they work in a pandemic without vaccines and PPE, like, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. really upsetting. I just hate, yeah. I just, I feel like I have new depths of like hatred for humans based on everything I see and interact with. And I'm like, I, um, I'm good with hating people and then also doing things for humanity. Like they, those two things coexist like really well for me, I mean, but I wow, have, people suck right now. Like one of my yeah. core values is like people are people. And like, I usually like them a lot. I usually like people a lot. And I, and I believe that like most people are trying their best and sometimes their best doesn't look that great. Like I deeply, I'm like that Pollyanna about it, but also there's like a not today motherfucker. You know what I mean? Like there's like, <laughs> I, if this is your bad day and keep it to yourself. Like be a grown up and go do some breathing in your car. Like stop yelling. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah. Like that's where it's at. And like, you know, the support forum for veterinarians is just story after story, after story, after story of people, of, of people who are working as hard as they can, as fast as they can in a pandemic, getting yelled at for things that aren't their fault, you know? And it's just mm -hmm. like, I mean, it's those client conflicts, the pet owners like yelling at us and then they'll go on social media and trash us like, and we're not allowed to defend ourselves because of professional ethics codes. And so it's just like, mm -hmm. Anytime you see some story about like a terrible vet did something, I guarantee it's not true. <laughs> like I just guarantee, I guarantee that like they asked you to pull up, pay a bill that you agreed to. And like, this is what you right. need to do. Yeah. Um, and so it's, you know, like, and it sucks. It sucks. It's why veterinary medicine is hard. You know, like when people, you know, the people are always like, Oh, I just couldn't, I couldn't put down animals. That's so sad. And I'm like, I get that. But often like when that, comes to bear it's like a good choice for the pet and like we all feel like okay about that as long as it's in the pet's you know interest um right. not like i'm moving and i need you i can't take this dog like right. that is not okay but um you know often it's like not that but it's actually like no i went to school my whole life i went to i actually went to 12 years of college to become a veterinarian and like i go in a room and there's nothing i want to do more in life than fix that dog nothing on the planet. Like I, I will go without sleep. I go without eating. I will go, I've gone 18 hours without peeing. Like I will do anything. Oh right. God. And then you tell me that you can't afford to do anything that you have no financial plan for your pet. And like, I know that you didn't plan for this to happen to your pet either. Like nobody's happy about this situation, but too often it claps back at the vet. You know, like if you loved animals, you do it for free. Yeah. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard that. Like, um, yep. so yeah, it's, it's really tough. It, it causes like, that's the number one dis dis cause of distress in vets. It's called moral distress. Like we want to do the thing that we like feel is right, but circumstances prevent us so often. Like the pet owner doesn't believe in doing surgery on dogs or like, they don't think that they can, they can be bothered to give the medication or like whatever the reason it's just like, we just like, please let me help please. Yeah. Like it's all I wanted to do ever since I was like, five years old, <laughs> you know, like yeah. and it just sucks. So. I think that shows up in so many helping spaces that in general, like if your job is to help with something, yeah. people somehow think you should just be not be compensated for that. Like that you're supposed to just do it because you care. Um, and it's like, well, we, yes. we, all, we all chose capitalism, like, or we're like continuing to while we're not overthrowing things or whatever. So, so <laughs> in the meantime, while we're doing capitalism, you got to pay me for my I, career. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I please believe like anytime as a veterinarian and anytime anyone, because everybody does, everyone I've ever met in my entire life from my like third grade teacher I haven't talked to in 40 years forward is like, hey, Carrie, you're a vet. What kind of dog should I get? And my answer without <laughs> missing a beat is one with insurance. Done. Right. Like, I don't care what teacup, fluffy poodle, whatever you get. Like, I don't care import that Russian snoodle with like four heads. I don't care. Please just make sure you have a real plan for its medical care. So I can do the thing that I want to do that you want me to do. Like, that's it. That's it. So yeah. Um, yeah. That's my rant. There's my beef. There it is. I, I love having insurance. It's so worth it. I uh, have, 
I adopt like old, old chihuahuas and you know what? They'll live for fucking ever yeah, if you them. have good medical care for them. <laughs> yes. But the I'm a loser and do not have. The <laughs> anger and hate in their souls will keep them alive a long time. <laughs> I know. I love them so much. It's just, I relate so much to their like stupid little brains. I just. <laughs> One of my favorite that I've ever seen um, is this like, my chihuahua is an angel and then she's like so was lucifer <laughs> oh i just never knew i was gonna get to talk good. about chihuahuas and suicide in the same show and it's just really good it's really good are you okay i'm a, i'm gonna be okay i'm just very excited about it <laughs> does this episode bring you down to like a three yeah, probably. I'll probably cry about it later. I cry about everything, mostly good stuff, but also sometimes bad stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm a crier. Like I get like something will be on TV, and my, like my husband will like, like feel me like shudder, and he'd be like, "What?" And I'm like, yeah. "Leave me alone." <laughs> like, yeah, I've like recently mastered like silent crying in Zoom calls because you can't see the tears so much. Um, but you have to have the right mascara if you're going to wear mascara for your Zoom. Absolutely. Mascara is part of my mental health plan, so there yeah. will be mascara. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Des, do you have a specific beef you would like to talk about before we move on? Uh, it, Amelia to... wanted you to talk about AAS, AFLE. I don't want to fucking talk about AAS. AAS yeah. is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> No interest in discussing that right now. Yeah, um, my semester starts in like a week and I don't want to. Like I don't. You have to what? My semester starts in like a week and I don't want to. Oh, well, can you delay it? Yeah. I'll write you a note. Be like, my veterinarian wrote me a note. Uh, <laughs> no. no, I got to I gotta get through this shit. My old man cat lives off hate alone. <laughs> uh, people would like to know if health... People have questions about pet insurance and which pet insurance is to get. There we go. Okay, here's where we will do like proper dis disclosures. Like I actually, one of my four jobs is I, I work a little bit with Trupan. Yeah. I work with them because I believe in them and yeah. like they're a great company. Um, and all of my pets have Trupanion health insurance and had it before I worked with that company. So I think That's what for I someone have. like me, um, I am I am like high level, like scary medical care. And I've never seen Trupanion mess around, like never. Like they just pay it and there's no shenanigans. What I really tell people to look for in pet insurance is like the good companies pay 80 to 90% of your bill. And there are, they're like, there's all sorts of like tricky clauses and you just need to read very carefully. Like some of them don't cover routine care because like some vets have what are called wellness plans, which are great and like, help you get that. But then you're paying, you're double paying if you've got this other thing. Right. And so like, just really be careful and like, know what you're getting. Like you have routine care stuff and then you have like major medical insurance. And so like Trupanion is really great major, major medical insurance. Um, there are a bunch of other reputable com companies as well. Um, but yeah, like I, I tell people like if it's, if it's talking about like per condition limits and things like that, like um, and I always tell people there is no Obamacare for dogs. So pre-existing conditions are a thing with every single one of them. So get the insurance while your pet is young and healthy, or mm -hmm. if you adopt older ones, accept that there will be excluded things. So. Yeah. 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 So. Mm -hmm. um, what else? Have, what else is in our notes? Should I ask? Okay. I wasn't sure if I needed to move on. Oh, I don't, I don't um, have all the beef. So I'm, I'm interested in talking about why you, we think peer support is important. Um, in suicide intervention. And then um, also want you to talk about not one more vet a little bit more in depth before we go. Yeah. Those are the last two things. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think, you know, the really the cornerstone, the reason that not one more vet exists is peer support. Um, I think especially when you're talking about a stigmatized problem um, within a group of people, like if I tell you about something, I would just, I, I, if you're my peer, if you have the same lived experience as me, like we can skip like 400 conversations, right? Um, and so if I'm talking to another veterinarian and I bring up something hard that happened, I don't have to explain all of the emotions behind it, right? Like they get, they've been there. You know, like I had a really tough euthanasia today. Like there's a couple of categories of really tough euthanasias and like they can access really quickly of like, it was the old man with his dog. And it's like, oh, I know exactly why that one's hard. Like that's that man's last friend in the world. And like you had to sever that connection. Like 
I know why that one's hard. Like, you don't have to explain it to me. Like, you're like, old man, little dog. You know, it was his wife's last, you know, the last memory he had of his wife. You know, you're like, oh, mm-hmm. like, been there, done that. Like, ooh, it was a service dog. Like, ugh. Like, you know, like, so those quick moments, like that code lets us reach a deeper level of conversation so much more. And also, like, veterinarians are cynical. Like, I can speak for my peers. I won't speak generally about peers, but we are cynical creatures. Um, it's part of why we like medicine, right? Like, we question and, like, um, and I won't believe that solutions work unless somebody who gets me tells me that they will, you know? And so that's so powerful, you know, especially yeah. you're talking about someone who is really seriously considering suicide. Like this is the solution that they've come up with. And you're like, I've considered that solution, been there, but mm-hmm. Hey, have you also considered, this is what worked for me. And I love, I, we have a phrase on Nambi that says share experiences, not advice. Nobody likes to be told what to do. Nobody likes to be told what to do. Um, you get, you get across the table from me and like point your, no, fuck off. Like, no, <laughs> like me talking to another vet of like, you know, this is how I think about that hard euthanasia you've had. This is how I think about this. Like, this is how with my ridiculous on-call schedule, I actually managed to like fit in like healthy eating or exercise or whatever, you know, the like standard, like, of course you feel better when you've eaten a vegetable this year. Like, of course you do. Like, don't like, we're all grownups. We recognize that. Like no grown up needs to be told to eat a salad, but like, like this is an actual way that I managed to accomplish that is an a different, is a different thing entirely. Right. Like, when I, mm-hmm. I go talk to vet students and I'm like, yeah, you do like to handle stress better, like exercise is a good idea. And like, I'm not going to tell your grownups with getting medical degrees. Of course, you know that exercise is a good idea, but like, here's how you can legitimately achieve it. Like, this is what you're going to have to give up. Like spoilers, 45 minutes, of sleep. you know, like, <laughs> you know, like it just that, that realness is so important. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's not just like, Please do yoga. Have you tried deep breathing? Yeah. Well, like sort of mindfulness. I mean, I you can't breathing. say those things, but I mean, yeah. I'm a big fan of breathing. I'm like, but I give examples of like when I use yeah. it. I'm like, when I hear not the pandemic, now everybody's in the parking lot, like, but when I hear the client starting to yell at my receptionist about the bill, and I have to go step up there in a white coat and be a doctor, and like, and I'm not allowed to hit them, right? That's not okay. Um, apparently, I hear. Uh, it's in the employee handbook. Um, but like, once again, like, you know, like that's where I'm like, you need to handle everything that's in you right that minute. Like, cause you need to go be a grown up for a second. And so you're just like, okay, that's when I do the deep breath. You can do one. You can do one in the middle of a client screaming at you too, to just kind of be like, okay. <laughs> if you do it audibly, sometimes they'll figure out they're being a jerk, you know? <laughs> so like, yeah, I mean, so I think that's the difference between someone who's just like casually and kind of thoughtlessly giving advice versus a peer being like, this is when that kind of trait technique, you know, like those techniques do work, but like, like here is a real world example where it might be helpful, like give it a try. And like, if it's not helpful, then okay, like whatever, try some else. But like, I really hate, I really hate when people treat wellness like there's this exact plan and as long as you do the exact plan, you're gonna be perfectly fine. Uh, yes. Like it's so infuriating. Like yep. as talked about probably too much, I have ADHD telling me to sit still for anything in life is mm-hmm. akin to torture. And like yeah. telling me to meditate, like I have tried so many meditation yeah. apps plans and anything over five minutes, I immediately, I'm like, nope, can't, nope, God. And so like, but for me, like I run and I can reach that state that way. And so it's like, don't tell me that I have to, cause I can't. So like, I should give yeah. up, and, like lay under the desk, like stop it. Like, it's just, I think we, when we talk about educating people on how to take care of themselves. I like to give a widespread, like, these are all the things, please pick four or five and give them a try and like, see how it goes. If you like those, <laughs> you don't like throw them back and get some other ones. Like figure it out though. Like some people like to color. I fucking hate to color, man. Like, eh, I, um, I, we make flame throwing art in my house. Like I like to set stuff on fire in a safer way. Um, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, but I, I like to break things in the bath, like break ice in the bathtub. Cause it's a really loud sound, you know, yeah. but then it just melts. I really hate loud sounds. So that one would, if my husband did that right now, there would be like the white face, you know, like the like, yeah, yeah. 
why is there a noise? Um, but yeah, like that's why so squirrel back to the original question, like peer support, I think, is about like somebody who gets you having a conversation. Mm -hmm. It's not this like scary, I have to go to a doctor and what is that doctor gonna do? And what are they gonna write in my chart? And God is the veterinary medical board gonna see that chart and then they're gonna take my license. It's like you're just talking to somebody. It's a lot like we just went and had a beer, you know, and talked. Mm -hmm a lot friendlier and it's a lot safer mm -hmm. and i think we get to have those really scary conversations faster when we feel safe so yeah. and like one of the most evidence-based parts of any suicide intervention or training that we have, have ever come up with is just asking people about suicide like that's the thing that we know reduces people's distress the most yeah. um that like that we have a real evidence base for so like, if that's the case, anyone can do that. We don't need to be professionals to do that. There's all kinds of things that we can get trained on to make us better at talking with people. Um, I think it helps to have like unpacked a little bit of your own bullshit um, some before you talk to other people. Yeah. Um, but like, you don't always have to be in like perfect form either, right? right. Uh, but just like the willingness to ask and then just be with someone in, in whatever they're gonna respond with. So you're not afraid of their response. Right. I feel like those two things, that's like the magic and it's uh, easier said than done, obviously. Otherwise we would be doing mm -hmm. it a little more, but. Honestly, I think it's it takes time. It takes time, it's yeah. not fast. But I have seen more people talk to themselves out of suicide just because I was willing to sit there oh, and yeah. talk to them than mm -hmm. I think anything in the world. You know what I mean? Oh, like, yeah. Yeah, and like, you know, I am a, pushy, bossy person. And so like, I do have to check myself like often. Same. Um, but like, because I know, like if somebody told me what to do, I would, I would log off of the computer. I'd be like, no, 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 no to you. No. Right. One of my best friends in life, she, she, she can get a little like, well, you know, and I'm like, stop it. Yeah. Stop. Um, that but, stuff yeah. makes me want to like revenge kill myself too. I am always prone to revenge killing myself though. <laughs> but like when someone's like telling me what to do, I'm like, oh, I'm going to kill myself now. Watch. Uh, Get your name on the yeah. headstone oh or God. whatever. I'm going to name names. Oh, your name is one of them. That's a terrible Netflix show. I can't. Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, oh. They, it died in a fire. But um, yeah. So. Yeah. Um, Does but anyone have any blank cassettes? <laughs> No, it is not 1984. Um, so, but so like, that's where Navi started, right? It was just like, can we just talk about why it sucks? And so like a lot of critiques of our organization is like, well, that's just a place where people are really negative. And I'm like, no, it's the place that people come to talk about what sucks. So it does tilt a little negative occasionally. It does. Like we, we do oh, like, nice. you know, like we try to share some dog pictures because spoilers, veterinarians like animals. So that works pretty well. Um, but like, you know, like it can get, it can get a little, little sad in there sometimes, but it also is mm -hmm. I see a lot of like really hopeful stuff in there too, of like people who do care about their, their peers. And it, it, that's, that's really, you know, it's really beautiful. Um, yeah. Yeah. But Nambi does a lot of things now that weren't in the original brief because I don't know, cause we're all squirrels and we want more projects. Um, mm -hmm. We became a charity um because we wanted to like sometimes you just need a little bit of money you know like sometimes like the uh, problem is like my car broke down and i can't get to work and i'm gonna miss rent if i can't you know like sometimes that's the problem like you know and it was mm -hmm. like if we can fundraise we can help those people so our organization gave out fifty thousand dollars worth of grants last year to veterinary professionals oh, yeah. there's a grant application on the website nomv.org if you need help if you're a veterinary professional um, and that's anybody who works in the field, receptionist, kennel worker, anybody just hit us up. Um, a grant team member will be right with you. Practical assistance like that is so much yes. of what people need when they're in crisis I mean, and there's like, nowhere to get it. So that's so awesome. I love our new employee, Danielle, because she's worked in nonprofits for a long time. So she knows all of these, like, she's like, Ooh, this food pantry will do it. Like, and I'm like, this is amazing. So yeah, that's, that's awesome. grants. And then my, my pet project that I'm doing right now is called Lifeboat which is a new completely anonymous service where a person in distress will be matched with three of their peers. Um, they're, we ask them to remain anonymous. We want them to feel super safe. And those three peers are going to sit with you. And those are trained people. And 
so they can create that like supportive structure for people. Because we noticed that when people would reach out in crisis, what they really needed was like somebody who cared about them, like a consistent person. Mm -hmm. So the crisis line model, it, it has its uses, don't get me wrong. And, and we won't be yeah. you know, there 24 seven, but you know, this is somebody who knows the story, can pick up the thread, can be there for you in a longer way. Because what we, we found is there was this group of people who really needed a connection. They really needed a group mm -hmm that was stable for them. Um, and so I'm super excited about that. And I'm, I'm, we're working with the University of Tennessee, the veterinary social work program, mm -hmm. Dr. Elizabeth Strand and Angel That Walks the Earth. Um, and Dr. Witte, Dr. Tracy Witte at Auburn is helping us make that. Um, and I, I really, I'm so excited. It'll launch later this year. You know, like everything, COVID slowed it down. We lost oh, our yeah. He's trapped in China. So <laughs> <laughs> like we'll get there though yeah. we'll get yeah. there um but yeah and we do other stuff we do research projects we i give a bunch of lectures and things like that because like we want to we want to fix this right like i i don't think the problem will ever go away but i want people to know that they're not alone and there's absolutely help like we want to help you yeah. absolutely so yeah I love it. Cool. Um, we did have one more question. I feel like I feel like this is valid. Do oh, yeah. you think people with lived experience are more comfortable with the answers to the suicide question? Hmm. I think I think yes. I think maybe if you felt suicidal and survived it yourself, like you can have that conversation with your heart rate going maybe. 10% less high than a person who has never had that feeling before, right? You could be like, oh, girl, me too. Like, you know, like, but like, <laughs> but hey, I didn't and you shouldn't either. And let's talk about why. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's probably some folks for whom, like, that that's not true for. Um, but I, I do think that lived experience makes it, makes it easier to explore. Mm -hmm. uh, because sure. you, like, you know that you can feel that way and you can live. So you're not just reacting from this like super fear place. Well, and I feel like, you know, so many suicidal people are in the, there is no hope place. And like, mm -hmm. I get that. I've had the hopeless place. I've been there the bottom of the pit with like, you know, like ratty blanket. I've been there, but like, mm -hmm. you know, and to be like, I have been there. I have been there. I have written these things down. I get it. But like, there is, and like, it sucks. And I'm not gonna tell you it's gonna be quick either. Like, I'm not gonna paint this like bullshit, toxic positivity, rosy picture for you either. Like, absolutely mm -hmm. not. Like, no, the next maybe year is gonna suck balls, but like, hey, we're gonna still get through it. And then maybe the next year's better. Great. Yeah. So. Hopefully. Hopefully, Hopefully. yep. Yeah. Unless <laughs> the next year is 2020 or 2021 so far. Lord. Holy fuck, Lord. for real. <laughs> For real, for real. What is happening? Oh, that's too big of a question for this podcast. <laughs> at, even at the beginning. Um, and we are at the end. So are there any Good. final things that anyone wants to say before we go? I got a banner. I don't know. Ah, Mike and Asbeth <laughs> is going to be on to talk about guns mm -hmm. and means restriction next time. If people are interested in that topic, we brushed on it a little bit tonight. Um, Good news, but, Mike and Estes and I tend to disagree with each other. So we're going to have some really interesting oh, conversation. Oh uh, <laughs> but we, we like nicely disagree with each other because I think we generally respect my, each other. Some of my favorite friends in life and I like just love to argue and it's fine. Yeah. It's a loving argument. It's a loving <laughs> argument. It's fine. Yeah. It's our love language and it's fine. Um, right. And I really like to split hairs, so um, so we can expect <laughs> that um, next time. Um, hey, you argue with me, all right? <laughs> that is that's also a good T-shirt idea. For you. I really like to split hairs. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Carrie, is there anything else that you want to say before well, we go? Thank you, guys. This was super fun. Yeah, um, thanks yeah, for coming here and and you know cuss and be myself. So I appreciate it. Yeah. So. Yeah, this was great. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Very cool. I'm excited, um, as usual. All right, Des, I think we can wrap up. I'll see you all yeah, and then. next time, people. Sounds good. Maybe if, like, we haven't been blown up, who the fuck knows? Yeah, who knows? Um, I'm going to hit the end broadcast button, I guess. It'll be fine. No one, everyone just stay home. It's still a pandemic. Everyone's going to be great. Everyone it gets better. Everyone just stays home.
things could be better than they are right now. I know. I know home is boring. I know you finished Netflix, but please, please, as someone who has had COVID, you don't want it. Stay home. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. I, mean, I like staying home. I'm into Zero it. Stars. Everybody's oh, yeah. Do not recommend COVID. Zero stars. No. Um, so. Can't confirm. No. All right. All right. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>